Tokusatsu. This is a Japanese term for live-action film or television drama that uses a shit ton of special effects in Japan. The themes of any show that fall under this term can range from fantasy and horror to just plain science fiction. The popularization of this term started in the 1950s with the conception of the kaiju Godzilla, which now is an obvious basic household name. Ironically, Japan was influenced by America's King Kong in the very first place. This in 1954 kickstarted what's widely known as the Monster Boom, which featured an actor in a monster costume with miniatures to make the illusion that they were actually giant. Before CG, there were practical effects, so they had to do what they had to. And for the time, it was very revolutionary, and currently now remains honestly pretty timeless. This was the standard for a while until 1957, when the first giant superhero was introduced in Japan, creatively named Super Giant. They had the whole creative team for that one, if you couldn't tell. This started what was known as the Henshin Boom, which favored heroes in masks fighting their previous giant enemies, or rather than fighting the giant monster themselves. For those unaware, Henshin means to transform. Shows like Kamen Rider, Astro Boy, Ultraman, Seven Color Mask, Moonlight Mask, and many other shows like that in its time changed tokusatsu forever. Though in the 70s, the most popular tokusatsu shows included Kamen Rider, Warrior of Love Rainbow Man, Super Sentai, and Spider-Man. Yeah, this was a thing, and he had a giant robot. Although toku shows were really popular in Japan, the concept and art form wasn't really taken that seriously in America. Again, ironic. Fortunately though, to make a long story short, a godly man with the name of Haim Saban decided he was really fucking with Super Sentai, and after being rejected multiple, multiple times, he eventually got it Americanized, and what was known as the Super Sentai Zoo Ranger soon got adapted into what we all know as the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. I mean, it's no tattooed teenage alien crime fighters from Beverly Hills, but I ain't complaining. Anyways, it was a smashing hit and a big fucking cash cow. They were on the news, TV spot appearances, sold out shows at Universal Studios, had their own Power Ranger karate camps, and even got a high budget blockbuster movie in 1995 that really kicked ass. There's a really good show on Netflix called The Toys That Made Us that has a really good episode explaining the process and getting to where Saban did to make Power Rangers such a commercial success. Simple formula that saved money since all the suit footage was already recorded and would be just dubbed over. I mean, it genuinely was a perfect formula and very cost effective too. So perfect in fact that Saban tried to adapt more toku shows along with Power Rangers. This was in order to capitalize on his popularity and make more money. I mean, don't get me wrong, it sounded really good on paper, but we're not reading books, are we? Saban soon decided that it would be a good idea to adapt toku shows like the Metal Heroes franchise, including but not limited to Juko B-Fighter and the Superhuman Machine Metalder. We know these shows as Big Bad Beetleborgs and VR Troopers. We also know that they did not do nearly as well like it all. But before that, there was an earlier attempt that really could have gone somewhere. And I mean really, but it it didn't. Saban tried their hands at taking a stab at adapting a tokusatsu franchise that's known as Kamen Rider, specifically Kamen Rider Black RX, into what was adapted into what we know as Mask Rider. And with that, I think it's high time to pass the mic to a fellow tokusatsu nerd and personal friend. Take it away, D'Angelo. Thanks, Joe. Hello, everyone. My name is D'Angelo Edwards, host of Hats Off and would-be Blue Ranger. If Andre hadn't snatched my glory away. But violent personal grudges aside, let's talk Mask Rider. But if we're going to talk about the adaptation, we gotta dive into the original. So it's time for Common Rider. Created by Shotaro Ishinomori, who not only created Kamen Rider and Super Sentai, he also made Cyborg 009, which is my jam, and if you haven't seen the early 2000s adaptation, you need to get on that, because it is the tits. Anyway, the first Kamen Rider series was about a young man who, after being abducted by an evil organization, is transformed into a cyborg, and rather than being their weapon? He decides to use his newfound power to fight for justice. Thus began the long, and I mean long, history of Kamen Rider. 
Seriously, it's been going on since 1971, and it is not showing any signs of slowing down. There are dozens upon dozens of Kamen Rider series out there now, most of them using a bug motif, because in Japan, bugs are like crazy popular. Which really helped to hit that prime shonen databayo market. So Saban would have been crazy not to take a shot at adapting it, especially after the success of Power Rangers. So Kamen Rider, or more specifically Kamen Rider Black RX, became Mask Rider, which is actually just a literal translation. Kamen means mask, and Rider is because almost every one of them rides a motorcycle. But speaking of that Power Rangers success, they saw that as a perfect chance to use that success to drop a backdoor pilot to Mask Rider in the form of a three-part special episode titled A Friend in Need. This episode starts off like a normal Power Rangers episode, but Alpha seems down. It appears that the planet he was built on is under attack. Which is weird because I always thought like Zordon maybe like birthed him like out of magic, but I digress. The planet Edenoi is being enslaved by the villainous Count Dragon, and the Edenites, Edenites, I guess, are being forced into slavery, digging up poisonous gas that's slowly killing them. Which kind of defeats the point of having slaves. That's immoral and wasteful. Wanting to help out Alpha. The rangers go to the planet and encounter a group of rebels led by Prince Dex, who has been gifted not only with the powers of the Masked Rider, but also a hefty amount of stock footage. Dex is played by TJ Roberts, California native and Karate Boy TM. Before landing this gig, he had a few bit parts in other shows before starring in a few direct to VHS Yo, sorry to cut you off, but I looked at this nigga that played Dex and I knew, I knew I saw him somewhere else after fucking Mask Rider. Like in fifth grade, my teacher would always have this case full of DVDs and one of them was this movie that starred this nigga in it and I thought she was fun to put on Mask Rider since I kinda knew of him at the time, but it was some kinda equal Really cool karate movie that involves some rings of power or, or something like that this was that movie like as i'm writing the script in detention i'm figuring that out yes i'm aware this has little to nothing to do with the video and yes i'm aware i could have found this out at literally any time I, i'm sorry d'angelo don't worry joe you'll pay me back i promise anyway jumping back to the episode Mask Rider and the Power Rangers team up, kinda, sorta, not really defeat Count Dragon, and they agree to help each other out from now on. But that's a lie, because they never see him again. Instead of making more appearances in Power Rangers, Dex goes on to star in his own show, the appropriately named, if not uninspired, Mask Rider. Now, a few changes were made when the show came out. First off, that whole taking place in the same universe as Power Rangers? Forget that. That ain't happen. This Dex and this Dex are not the same. Instead, in this show, Dex is sent to Earth to escape Count Dragon and his lust for Dex's fancy bug parts. Here, he makes a home with the nicest, most diverse, TV-appropriate, PC, democratic, cries at the Iron Giant soup kitchen goingness, BuzzFeed wet dreamiest family ever to grace the idiot box. Like, these guys are amazing. All they're missing is a kid in a wheelchair and it would be perfect. Dex is also joined by Furbis, a character that adults think kids will like, but will honestly just make them change the channel. Dex makes a home with these guys and using his powers protects his town from the villainous monsters Count Dragon sends down. These powers include increased strength, an electro blade, and some other more powerful forms he acquires later. Which sounds impressive, until you realize that base form Dex has the power to create anything with his mind. Like he makes a car and a motorcycle from his thoughts. And not only that, but they're sentient. Dex is on some Haruhi Suzumiya level shenanigans. But this all sounds great, right? Cool characters, monsters, sword attacks. It has all the stuff Power Rangers had. So, why did it fail? Well, it turns out... Mask Rider is a little better and a lot worse than we remembered it was. First off, let's start with the biggest problem, Dex. He really isn't that interesting. Most of the comedy featuring him boils down to, he's an alien, he doesn't understand Earth stuff, 
Like, he's a nice kid and God bless TJ, he is trying. But they clearly didn't put much work into the character. He was more interesting in the Power Rangers episode, where he was a rebel prince that didn't trust Easy. Here he's just some goober with one outfit. And speaking of Power Rangers, that's another problem. Mask Rider has one title character. Just one. So if you don't like him, well, I hope you dig Furbis. Meanwhile, Power Rangers had a team of six, so there's a pretty good chance that you were going to find at least one to latch on to. Speaking of, the supporting cast outside of the family is also kinda dull. There's a bully girl who I swear was the big sister, which confused me because one second she was nice, then she, the other she was trying to prank herself. Okay, that one might be my bad. Her little toady dude is also kinda memorable, but not because of his personality which is just standard saved by the bell nerd, but because of the way he dressed. Like, I think some wires were crossed. Maybe his wardrobe was supposed to go to another character, or maybe he was just a poser, no big. Same goes for the villain. Count Dragon is no Lord Zed. Heck, he's not even a finster. The villains spend most of their time in their ship, which is similar to Rita and Zed, but unlike them, they lack the campy fun. There are a few weirdos to keep it fresh, they even tried to make one of the villains like him, but you know Count Dragon stay on Thought Patrol. Even the monsters they send down to fight Dex just kinda came and went, and that combined with the not so great editing led to some less than impressive scenes. A lot of the time fights just seemed to go too quick or too long, and they would even use footage from unrelated Kamen Rider series. Bottom line is that they tried, and for what it's worth, I liked what we got, but the fact that we could have got a lot better really feels like a writer kick to the face. Watching Mask Rider again was quite an experience. I used to watch the two VHS tapes I had of it religiously. If the Power Ranger movie wasn't on TV, then you could bet this was. But I never understood why none of my friends really talked about it, and now I kinda get it. It's not super awful, especially if you're already in the mindset of watching a janky Saban show, but compared to Power Rangers or heck, even Big Bad Beetleborgs, it doesn't really have much to offer. I still love it for what it is though, and it had some cool moments here and there, with the Power Rangers crossover and the fact that the Kamen Rider series it was based on just happened to have one of the biggest crossovers take place with it. But besides the episodes I know by heart, I doubt I'll ever sit down and watch the whole show again. Still wanted on DVD though, so get on it Saban. Thanks D'Angelo, hats off to you. Certainly more civilized than some of our other guests. Growing up on like 50% Power Rangers in my household, I always wanted to find stuff just as high energy and colorful as Power Rangers is. And later got into the obvious TMNTs and Transformers, but soon I discovered the aforementioned Big Bad Beetleborgs, VR Troopers, and then Mask Rider. My personal experience wasn't even really that bad. I just kinda knew even then when as a kid watching this would-be Power Ranger spinoff that something was majorly off. It was akin to how a lot of you older folk felt after looking at Neil Saban Power Rangers after watching the actual gold that was RPM. It just didn't feel the same, with or without nostalgia glasses. As much as I wanted to like Mask Rider as a self-contained show, I just kinda couldn't. I first got into Power Rangers when my dad randomly bought a crate home of VHS tapes with a bunch of Disney stuff including a Power Rangers Wild Force VHS tape. At the time I was four, but since then I've been in love with the franchise. It's genuinely like my bread and butter. With such a long running franchise like Power Rangers, there's bound to be some bops, some flops, and then some downright confusing enigmas that were maybe too early for its time. Now in America, Kamen Rider is just as if not more popular than Super Sentai as a whole, and it honestly would be a good time for an American can Kamen Rider adaption. Seeing as the next season of Power Rangers will fully be Neo Saban free, I think there's real potential for a great adaption filled with love and care. But that's actually if they give a shit, which they don't. <laughs>
Hey, thanks for watching another one of my nerdy videos, you absolute beautiful beanbag. I always wanted to talk something Sentai related on this channel for a while, ever since I mentioned just how much of a Power Rangers nerd I am. I'd like to, of course, take this time to thank a few people for making this video possible. Firstly, a big thanks to D'Angelo over at Hats Off Media for so graciously being a part of this video. Please check him out. His stuff is really, really good, and he's really underrated. I'd also like to thank my friend Eldridge for helping me out with the thumbnail somewhat. I had a lot of drafts, and this was my final draft, but I, I ran it by him, and he kind of tweaked it a bit for me. I'd also like to thank my patrons for donating. I really appreciate it and it means the world. Patrons always in the outro at the end of the video. Patreon.com slash Veritas Show if you want to donate. It'd be really neat if you could follow my socials. Instagram at SuperSkateboardPro.exe and Twitter at Veritas Joe. That's if you want to keep tabs on me and remember that I, you know, kind of exist outside of uh, YouTube. Overall though, thanks for watching me nerd out for like a summer minutes and I I'm glad you enjoyed. Just remember guys, wherever you go, let the power protect you. Come out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't like attention.